again for being here today. We begin a new series this morning, and it's a series that's going to take a few weeks. So if this is your first Sunday with us, I want to encourage you to stick it out for at least a few weeks because we're going to begin this morning a series entitled Heaven, and we're going to ask a lot of questions about heaven and the Bible answers, but we can't get through all of that today. So there are all sorts of questions that people have about heaven, about the afterlife, and we're going to try to deal with that as we walk through this series in about six or eight weeks. Uh, so I want to encourage you to hang with us, to be here, so that we can learn and grow together. And really, even a lot of the titles of my sermons are going to be questions. So today, the, the first title and the first sermon in this series is, What's So Great About Heaven? What's So Great About Heaven? And if you have a Bible, I want to ask you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. Now, normally in a sermon... I'm going to open to one section of Scripture, and that's where we'll stay the whole time. And I encourage you just to stay right there in 1 Corinthians 2. But we're going to look at a lot of other verses today. They'll be on your screens. If you don't have a Bible with you today, there's one in the seat in front of you, and you can open to page 619, and right there you'll see 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. And if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that one with you. That's a, a Bible that's our gift to you. It's a version that I preach out of, so it'll be the same as you walk through that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. There are a lot of questions. There's lots of confusion about heaven. Lots of ideas and lots of opinions. Lots of different people have lots of different perspectives. But through this series, we're going to do our best to answer some of the most important questions. And the most important questions, is it for real? Is it for me? Is heaven really a real place that exists? Or is it just one of those things we talk about that's a, a, a good thing, heaven on earth? Or, or, or maybe all dogs go to heaven. Or maybe, you know, maybe I get to go there. Maybe it's real. Is it for me? Is that a place that people really go? Is it something that we really get to experience? We'll talk about all that throughout this series. Where would you go if you could go anywhere? I want to ask you that question. I want you to think about this. Where would you go if you could go anywhere? A little over 100 miles from here is a place called Hartsville-Jackson International Airport. Hartsville-Jackson International Airport, about 109 miles from this very building. And every single day, 260,000 people travel through that airport. Unless you were flying Delta last week. About every day, 260,000 people travel through that airport. And if you've ever been there, you feel like you are last in line behind all 260,000 people at the security checkpoint. Atlanta and that airport serves as a gateway for the world. You can go almost anywhere in the world from Atlanta. I mean, some people say that if you want to go to heaven, you first have to go through the Atlanta airport for a connecting flight. Have you heard that? Like, it go, you go everywhere, and you can go to some wonderful and amazing, unique destinations. Let, think about this. If you could go anywhere you wanted to go on this earth, the ultimate destination, where would you go? And some of you think, I want sand between my toes, and waves crashing on the shore, an umbrella over my head and a book in my hand, that is where I would go. Others of you are like, ocean salty, sand is gross, you get sticky at the beach. Maybe you want to be in a nice mountain cabin overlooking a beautiful lake. Or maybe if you open the back door, you can hear the, the babbling brook. That would be the ultimate place. Maybe for you, you want to go to a nice beautiful snow-capped mountain and strap on those skis and ski downhill every afternoon. Maybe that's the ultimate place for me and for my wife, anywhere without the kids, right? That's the ultimate destination. That's a great vacation, okay? If you go with your kids, I've said this, right? If you go on vacation with your children, it's really just moving chaos from one destination to the other. That's all it is. It's not a vacation. But if you could think, where would be the ultimate place that you would go? But I, want to, I don't want to burst your bubble, but I, I want you to understand, wherever you go on this earth, we'll still have problems. 
they'll still, whatever city you go to, they'll still, in every city, they'll be a criminal. Every rose will still have a thorn. Every place you may drive down and see someone holding a sign that's homeless and says, we'll work for food. There's no place on this earth that's the perfect destination. No matter how much you want to go there, no matter how much you think that's the ultimate place, if I could just be there. There's no place on this earth that's the ultimate destination. In fact, the Bible tells us that you were not made to exist on this earth forever. In fact, in the end, we're really not supposed to be at home on the earth. We were made for another world. We were made to exist eternally with God in a real, literal place called heaven. And we'll talk about that today. We'll talk about what the Bible has to say. But today I want to ask a question, and I want to try to answer this question briefly, and we'll see this throughout the next several weeks. What's so great about heaven? There's a place that is greater than you've ever imagined, far beyond your wildest dreams, as wonderful, as majestic, as perfect as a place could ever be. That is heaven. And this is not a fairy tale. It's not a children's story. It's not a myth or a legend. It is reality, a real, literal place where God dwells and where you and I can dwell forever, for all of eternity. The Bible says right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. I love the way another translation says, Eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and it's not entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love Him. Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, so what's Paul saying? There's a place that's greater than you could ever imagine. A place that's greater than anything you've ever seen. A place that's greater than anything you've ever heard about. A place that's so great it hasn't even entered into your mind or your imagination. What's he talking about? He's not talking about Mexico. He's not talking about the Bahamas. He's not talking about Jamaica. He's not talking about a cruise. He's talking about heaven. A place that God has prepared for those who love him. Now I don't have to remind you, there is a timeline For human existence. Do you know that? We're born. We live our lives. We die. Then eternity. It's really that simple. When you walk through a cemetery. You see the gravestones. You're born. There's a dash. You die. Then eternity. And so I want to whet your appetite today. And I want to challenge you to make sure you know that heaven is your eternal destination. I want to create a desire in you through the Word of God and the Spirit as He speaks that that's the place that you want to go and you want to make sure that heaven is your home. First of all, I want you to know this morning there is a lot of confusion about heaven. There is a lot of confusion about heaven. Here, Paul says that heaven is a prepared place. So point number one, there's a lot of confusion about heaven. The Bible says that God has prepared something wonderful and incredible for those who love Him. You see that right here. God has prepared a place for those who love Him. But the reality is there are so many people talking about heaven. There are so many books about out-of-body experiences and and those who quote-unquote visited heaven. There, There are so many people who talk about so many things about heaven. What is really true and what's not? It could be difficult to discern truth from lies. And in fact, there's a lot of misinformation about heaven. And as a preacher, it hate it pains me to say this and I hate it, but one of the worst places to learn about heaven is at a funeral. You know that? You ever been to a funeral and somebody gets up and starts talking about the person that died? And Well, I know they've got their wings and they're floating around up there right now playing their harp, sitting on a cloud. Where do you get that from? Let me just go ahead. You will never be an angel. I know to your mama, she thinks you're an angel. I understand. But you will never have wings and a harp and sit on a cloud. You are not going to be an angel. That's not what heaven is. 
Heaven's not just sitting around on clouds, floating around, having a good time, singing, and maybe eating some Krispy Kreme donuts. That's not what heaven is. Somebody asked me if I was going to talk about Krispy Kreme again this Sunday. That's not what heaven is. It's different than that. They'll say, well, you know, every time you see a shooting star, a person gets their wings. You ever heard of that? How about that? So, so where do you get that from? I don't see anything in here about a shooting star and angels' wings. I don't, I don't see that. Well, they'll, they'll talk about, well, you know, you got to go to another place first. You got to go to another place first, and you got to work really hard in that other place called purgatory, and you got to have lots of people pray for you, and then maybe, just maybe, you'll make it to heaven. But there's only one problem with that. You don't find that in the Bible. The Bible says that this life is the test for eternity. And that what you do with Jesus determines your destiny. And you don't find or discover in the Word of God anything that says, well, if you've been a good person, you can make it just barely by the skin of your teeth. That's, a, that's another myth, right? I've seen it at funerals. Especially, well, he's just, just a real good person. And I'm sure that he was good enough that one day he's going to stand before God and God's going to weigh all the good and all the bad and all the good's going to outweigh the bad and he'll be he'll be able to make it into heaven. One problem with that, it's not in the Bible. That's not the way it works. God is the one who created everything. God's the one who created you. God's the one who created heaven. God's the one who's in charge. And he says it's not by what we do. That's not how we get to heaven. It's by what he has done through Jesus Christ. And so we've got to know what that means. We've got to know what that means. We've got to study the word of God. There's even a Brad Paisley song, right? When I get where I'm going. You know that song? Oh, we love that song because we're Christians and we think, man, that's great. He talks about riding a drop of rain in that song. What does that mean? How do you ride a drop of rain? He, he talks about how, uh, how he's going he's gonna to float on angels' wings in that song. Hey, great song. It's just don't get your theology from country music, okay? Bad idea. Bad idea. Now, one of the things he says in the song is, I'll stand in the light of his amazing grace. I believe that. That's good. But don't get all your theology and all your beliefs from a country song. You will be a depressed human being, okay? There's a lot of misinformation about heaven. And can I just tell I'm about to tell you a story. But can I tell you, this is a story. So anytime you hear somebody say, well, so-and-so walked up to heaven and there was St. Peter and St. Peter was man in the gate, you need to know that's not true, Okay? St. Peter's not there with his list checking it twice to make sure that you get in, okay? It's just a story. It's just a joke. So I heard a story. Not true. I heard a story. A man dies and goes to heaven. Of course, St. Peter, not true, okay? St. Peter meets him at the pearly gates, and St. Peter says, All right, here's how it works. You've got to have 100 points to get into heaven. The man said, My goodness, I've got to have 100 points. Okay. Peter says, okay, I'm taking a list here. Tell me what you've done in life to, to get 100 points. He said, well, I was married to the same woman for 50 years in life. Never cheated on her, not even in my heart. Peter said, that's great. That's worth three points. The guy said, three points? Did you know my wife? No, no. Three points. He said, okay, what, what else did you do? you got to have 100 points. I taught church, Sunday school. With kids for 47 years. I was faithful. I hardly ever missed a Sunday. And Peter said, okay, let's get two points. Two points? He said, oh, I know, I know. This, this, this will get me in. I started a soup kitchen for the homeless in my community. And we fed thousands and thousands of people every year. And I ran that ministry for over three decades. Peter said, all right, that's one point. One point! He started adding up. He's got six. He said, man, by, by, at this rate, I'm only getting into heaven by the grace of God. Peter said, all right, come on in. <laughs> right, so funny story, not true, but it illustrates a point that we think we can earn our way or get enough points to get in. It's absolutely impossible. You can't be good enough to go to heaven. God knew that. God knew that you couldn't be good enough, that I couldn't be good enough, that Mother Teresa, she wasn't good enough, that Billy Graham or Franklin, they're not good enough. Nobody's good enough to go to heaven. And so that's why God sent Jesus Christ from heaven to earth 
He knew that we couldn't make it from earth to heaven. So he sent Jesus from heaven to earth to make a way. You see, the truth is, 93% of people in America believe there's a heaven. 69% believe they're going there. 54% believe there's a hell. Only 17% think they're going there. But the reality is, most people will not go to heaven. I'm going to tell you as a pastor, it breaks my heart to say that. Most people will not go to heaven. And it's not because God hasn't made a way. It's because they haven't followed His way. There's so much confusion and misinformation. In fact, the Bible says most people aren't going to heaven. And I just know this morning, my job is to tell you the truth, not to make you feel good. So I want you to understand, in my heart, I want you to know the truth so you can make an informed decision. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, they'll be on your screens. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it, enter by it are many. But the, look at this now, but the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. He's talking about to heaven. And look what he says. And those who find it are few. Man, what a tragic statement, but reality. Those who find the way, the road to heaven are few. Look at those words. How tragic. Not because God hasn't made it available, but because we don't receive His gift. Most people aren't going to heaven. You know why? Because reservations are required for heaven. You don't go to heaven by default. It's not automatic just by being human or just by being American or just by being righteous or just by being a good person that's not the way it works so first of all there's a lot of confusion about heaven secondly the Bible offers clarity about heaven and that's what we need we need clarity we need the truth to cut through all the lies and the fog and the confusion we need truth you see sometimes the truth hurts but we need to know the truth so that we can respond to the truth in the right way. Now, I want to be clear through this message. Even though we're going to be asking and answering questions, all of your questions will not be answered. I don't really know what kind of food they'll have in heaven. I have no idea. I know that some of you Baptists really, really want to know. But I don't know. I don't know about the crystal sea. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know about the streets of gold and the gates of pearl. I know it says they're there, but I don't know what it's going to look like. People have drawn pictures and illustrations and put them in books. And I just think that everything we've ever seen falls short, doesn't even come close to how awesome and amazing it really is going to be. What's so great? about heaven. Even though I won't answer all, all of your questions, I'm going to do my best to paint a picture for you. And by the way, the Bible isn't written to answer all your questions. You may think, well, I read the Bible and I want all my questions answered. The Bible's not written to answer every question you have about life, about God, and about eternity. The Bible is written to sponsor faith in your life and lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the answer. And so all your questions won't be answered, but we'll do our best to walk through so where do we get our information about heaven? Not from everybody who went and visited and came back and wrote a book. Can I tell you that? That's not where we get our information. Not from preachers at funerals, not trying to pick on preachers. Not from popular television shows. There's a new one coming out, The Good Place, something like that. Ted Danson is still on TV, who knew? Not from those TV shows. We get our information about heaven from the Bible. Because the God who created and dwells in heaven is the God who wrote the Bible and gave it to us. And look carefully at what it says right in the beginning of verse 9. It is written. Where does Paul go when he wants to give the church information? It is written. He quotes Isaiah 64 in verse 4. So Paul in the New Testament is going all the way back to the Old Testament saying, go back to the Bible. This is where we get our answers. This is why when I preach, I preach the Bible. 
I don't try to give you my opinions or my ideas. This is why some people get upset that we're not always in current events and we're not always talking about politics and we're not always talking about the latest terrorist attack or these sorts of things. In the end, ultimately, it's the Word of God that's going to transform us so we know how to handle all of the things that are coming our way. We, we find the answers in the Bible. It is written. So, first of all, I want to clear up some confusion this morning. The Bible talks about three heavens. Did you know that? Now you're really confused. Three heavens. They're really three. So, one for the really, really good people and one for the not so good and one who barely made it by the skin of their teeth. No, 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 no. That's not it. Three heavens in the Bible. And so, if you don't know this, you'll get confused when you read the Bible. It talks about heaven. You've got to know which one it's talking about. The first heaven. The first heaven is mentioned in Isaiah 55, and that is the sky and the clouds that we see where the birds fly. All right, so it's our atmosphere here. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is mentioned when Jesus, uh, when the Bible talks about God creating the world in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, 14 to 17, the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. And when it talks about that heaven, he talks about how he puts the sun in the sky and the moon and the stars. Now that's of course not our atmosphere, that's beyond our atmosphere. That's the second heaven. But you know the Bible talks about a third heaven as well. That, the third heaven, is the dwelling place of God place where the angels live. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Write down uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 in your notes. Paul is speaking of himself in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and says, I know a man, whether in the body or spirit, I do not know, who was caught up into the third heaven. In other words, God gave Paul a vision of heaven and Paul said it was so great I couldn't even write about it. I'm amazed that people who've been there and come back get to write bestsellers, but Paul didn't even do that. Interesting. The third heaven. So what we're talking about in this series is not the first heaven, the clouds and the sky where the birds fly. It's not the second heaven, the galaxies and all the galaxies beyond. It's the third heaven. That's what we know as heaven, the place where God dwells. In fact, Jesus prays in Matthew 6, 9, our Father in heaven. Heaven, Psalm eleven four. The Lord's throne is in heaven. What is heaven? It's the place where God dwells. A real, literal, physical place that is the dwelling place of God. Where is it? You ever thought about that? If that is a real place, where is it? We haven't found it on the Hubble telescope. Astronauts have been to space looking around. They haven't found heaven. Where is heaven? The only way, the only way I know how to describe it is by, based on what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 10, when Jesus ascends to go to heaven, he goes up. That's all it says. And they were looking up into the sky. Ephesians 4.10 says that Jesus ascended far above the heavens, so far beyond the galaxies. That's the second heaven. That means heaven is an actual place, a literal real place. Listen to what Jesus says in John 14 verses 1 to 4. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Jesus isn't talking about some figurative place that exists only in your imagination. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. For you, a literal place. So we don't have to be worried about the future. We don't have to be confused about all the misinformation. We know that heaven is real. Why? Because the Bible tells us it is. And the God who wrote the Bible tells us it is. Jesus calls it his Father's house. In my Father's house are many rooms. John 14, 6, Jesus says, here's the way to heaven. The only way to gain access to heaven Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So how do we make it there? What's our pathway to this real, physical, literal place? It is only through Jesus Christ. Colossians 3 says, if you've been raised with Christ, then seek things that are above. So a few things and then we're done. What's so great about heaven? First, Jesus is there. Jesus is there. What's so great about heaven? We love to talk about 
all the architectural stuff about heaven, all the atmospheric things, gates of pearl, crystal sea, no sun, no moon. I mean, Jesus is the light, all of these things. But in the end, heaven is awesome and incredible because it is the place where we see Jesus face to face. There's a song that says, I long to see my Savior most of all. The greatest wonder of heaven. I mean, when you get there, it's not going to be that you're in awe of how beautiful it is. It will be. You're not going to be in awe of streets that are, I mean, gold, asphalt. It's going to be great. You're not going to be in awe of, of all of that. You're going to be in awe of Jesus. A little girl was walking with her dad one day in the evening, and she looked up at the stars, and she said, Daddy, if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, I can't imagine what the right side must be. How beautiful and how incredible. You know what? It's, it's great and incredible because Jesus is there. Heaven is, is great because our loved ones are there. Our loved ones are there. The Bible tells us that when we come to Jesus, we're part of the family of God. When we come to Jesus, we're adopted into his family. Not just God is our father, but we have brothers and sisters in the Lord. And not just our spiritual family, but our physical family as well. There are people whom I knew on earth that I can't wait to see in heaven one day. Some of you got moms and dads. Some of you got sons or daughters. Brothers or sisters, friends. And you miss them so much. But the promise is for those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not goodbye, it's I'll see you later. A man said this. He said, as a boy, I thought of heaven as a city with domes and spires and beautiful streets inhabited by angels. By and by, my little brother died. And I thought of heaven as before with, with one inhabitant that I knew. Then another died, and some of my acquaintances died. So in time, I began to think of heaven as containing several people I knew, but not till one of my own little children died. That I began to think I had a treasure in heaven myself. Afterward, another went, and another. And by that time, I had so many acquaintances and so many children in heaven that I no longer thought of it merely as a city with streets of gold, but I thought of it as a place full of inhabitants. Now, there are so many loved ones there that sometimes I think I know more people in heaven than I do on earth. Heaven is so great because our loved ones are there. The earth is our temporary residence. Then next, heaven is so great because our inheritance is there. Did you know if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have an inheritance? Did you know that? You're included in the will. And the Bible says that we have the down payment of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit of God. But one day, we will receive our full reward. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, talks specifically about the inheritance that we receive through the living hope. We have in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercies caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Here it is. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You have an inheritance in heaven. I heard about a rich man who was near death. He was on his deathbed. He began to pray. He prayed so hard. He said, I don't want to leave everything behind. I want to take something with me. He prayed and prayed. And finally, one night, an angel appeared to him and said, you need to quit. You can't take anything to heaven with you. He said, no, please. He begged and begged. The angel went away and came back and said, all right, I checked with the, uh, I checked with the guys upstairs. You're allowed to take one thing to heaven with you. The man died, and he's standing there in line waiting to talk to St. Peter. Not true, right? He's got this bag, and Peter said, what are you doing? You can't bring anything into heaven. He said, oh, yeah, I got special permission. Peter checks his name and sees he's allowed one, you're allowed one carry-on. That's impressive. We don't get that much. Peter opens up the bag. I got to check the contents of the bag. And you know what that man did? That man had taken all of his earthly possessions, everything that he ever owned, and he put it in the, he sold everything, he put it in money, took the money, put it in gold bars, filled the bag with gold bars, and brought them to heaven. He was going to take his riches with him. And Peter opened it up and said, man, what in the world are you doing bringing pavement to heaven? Come on. And the Bible says there's streets of gold. So if you've been watching the Olympics lately, what's the best that you can get? 
the gold medal. There's going to be like, I'm telling you, Michael Phelps has enough for his own road, right? The Bible says that in heaven, those things that we value, like on earth, money, gold, possessions, that's stuff that we walk on. If that's the case, how much greater, amazing and wonderful could that place be? Asphalt is gold in heaven. But today, sadly, the real treasure is walked on. The word of God, the name of Christ, and we worship gold. One day, the real treasure is revealed. The name of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God, and gold is just pavement. The Bible says we have an inheritance there. And then the Bible says our reward is there. Our reward is there. What's the difference between a reward and an inheritance? You see, by virtue of being in the family, you receive an inheritance. But a reward is different. A reward is given for those who have done well in this life. The Bible says you don't get to heaven by doing good. But once you know Christ and follow him, you are given rewards for your faithful service. The Bible says that you will receive jewels in your crown. I believe things like people that we've won to Christ. People we've shared the gospel with. People so faithful in their walk with the Lord. Prayer. People... People that we don't even know, I think they're going to be in the front of the line. Not the big names, not the big church preachers, faithful prayer warriors, missionaries, laborers, Sunday school teachers. Our reward is in heaven. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. John MacArthur says this, when we enter heaven, there'll be three things that we'll say. Number one, I can't believe I made it. Number two, I never imagined heaven would be so beautiful. And number three, I wish that I would have done more for him. I wish that I would have done more. Yes, heaven is the ultimate place. Heaven is the great destination. You can't get there from Atlanta. Sometimes I think Atlanta with its traffic is the opposite direction. But the Bible says you must have reservations. The Bible says heaven is reserved for those, Revelation 21, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those who've responded to the Lord Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation. So anytime you travel to another country, you're required to carry documentation. That documentation is called a passport. If you want to go to another country, you're required to take your passport. It talks about where you're from. You tell them where you're going. They stamp your passport. You must give your passport to gain access and entry into that country. No passport, no entrance. I want you to imagine it like this. In order to enter heaven, a person must have a passport. And that passport must be stamped with the blood of Jesus Christ. No stamp, no entrance. Not how good you are. Not how righteous you are. Not how much you gave to charity. None of that matters. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ that gains us access and entrance into heaven. Do you have your passport? Is it stamped? With the blood of Jesus Christ that allows you to enter the place you were truly made for. 